Thank you very much. Thank you for that kind introduction. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, and I give my thanks to the conference organizers, to the members of the ASA, and to the people of Australia for inviting me to your country and receiving me so warmly. As I take up the challenge of wrapping up this conference on forging links, people, systems, archives, I recognize that the reason you asked me to come all the way from the dreary autumn rains of British Columbia to the glorious spring of Australia was not to give me a holiday, <laughs> though my husband and I are happy to take advantage of the flights to do just that. Rather, the, you asked me here to close your conference by considering future directions for archives and the archival profession. And knowing that I am all that stands between you and the wool pack, I shall do my job as expeditiously as possible perhaps with enough time for a few comments and discussions from the floor. I have spoken and written much in recent years about where I think archives and archivists ought to be going as we confront the challenges of the digital age. And I've been asked to reflect on those themes again today to build on the fascinating papers we've heard over the last days here at Parramatta. So those of you who have made the trek to conferences in North America or Europe in the recent past, or have dipped into the pages of Archivaria, or follow my 140 character comments on Twitter, you may be familiar with some of my ideas. Let me start by reflecting on the conference theme, forging links, people, systems, archives. This conference looked at how technology is changing the work of archivists and changing the way in which archivists relate to users, records, and content. The profession of digital archivist is crystallizing and as that role emerges, it fundamentally challenges our traditional roles. At the same time, the very nature of digital records challenges the sustainability of archival systems and collections. So how should archivists react to these changes? The phrase forging links is an excellent metaphor for the conference. To forge links is to build bridges, to establish connections, and to create new and stronger conditions in which to achieve our goal which I believe is to help society document its actions and transactions, its communications and decisions, so that we support and foster three pillars of a civilized society, accountability, identity, and memory. We have learned much in this conference that encourages our efforts to forge those links in order to create these new and stronger conditions. Tim Sherritt wowed us with the art of hacking showing us the tremendous potential of archives for those who even knows how many different types of investigation, analysis, interpretation, and artistic expression. I think dusty dead kittens have nothing on tugboat and destroyer redactions. Cassie Finley sings from the same songbook as me, reminding us of the inherently political nature of archival work and speculating on the greater freedom that can and does come when the archivist is separated from institutional boundaries. Justice Coates spoke eloquently today about the role and importance of records to the Royal Commission, even as she discomfited us by reminding us of the weaknesses in record-keeping systems in the near and more distant past. Frank Golding and Bonnie Durick reminded us that there are people behind the records we manage, or the records that are now lost. That our work is not an end in itself, but a means to a greater end, to supporting a civilized, respectful, honest society, one that treasures its collective memory, respects the multiplicity of identities in its midst, and holds the power brokers accountable for their actions. At this conference, we heard many excellent presentations that addressed ways to forge these links with users, donors, volunteers, records professionals, indigenous peoples, students, the public, and ourselves. The myriad of presentations were rich, deeply thoughtful, and engaging. I have much to tell my Canadian colleagues about how high the bar has been set here. It has been a powerful and thought-provoking experience for me, and I thank you again for the opportunity to participate. As I wrap up this conference then by looking toward the future, I agree that forging links is critical to fostering change as we address the paradigm shift brought by digital technologies. This paradigm shift is real, and archivists are trying very hard to accommodate. 
We have constructed EDRMS systems. We have built online descriptive tools. And we are working diligently on innovations in digital preservation. Many of the presentations this week on Open Australia, initiatives at PRO Victoria, the efforts of the Blue Shield, the need to revisit the ASA policy on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander records. These are all sincere and important efforts to cope with our changing world. We are also always struggling to stay on top of our pre-digital records environment, managing backlogs of paper records, coping with the increasingly severe threat of deteriorating audiovisual recordings, addressing the intense public pressure to digitize everything. As I listened to Tim Sherratt's amazing talk, I have to say I kept thinking of the hours and days and years of effort that went into digitizing the records that he was so ably capable of analyzing online. Let us not forget to praise that tremendous and unrecognized effort not unrecognized by Tim, but unrecognized by society. While we cannot ignore our current archival reality, we have to lift ourselves out of an analog status quo and start forging a new path, if we can keep playing with that metaphor, and reposition our world, including archives, archival institutions, and archival practitioners, more strategically for the future. Indeed, archivists have done some simply amazing things. And you, and I say you, not me, continue to do amazing things. I am a digital immigrant, a pre-Googleite. Like my grandmother, who was born in the age of the horse and buggy and died in the age of the jet plane, I have seen dramatic change in my world, the archival world, in the course of my 30-year career. I am old enough to remember a time before descriptive or preservation or record-keeping standards, before online databases, before the maturing of organizations like the Association of Canadian Archivists, the Australian Society of Archivists, or the International Council on Archives. I remember a time when researchers had to write letters to an institution to ask if they had records on such and such, to make an appointment to view the materials, and then to fly across the country, and in Canada as in Australia, that can be a long haul, to see these records in person. I remember floppy disks. I still have some. <laughs> so I want to begin by applauding all of those who get into the trenches of day-to-day -day records and archives management. I've been there. I know how tough it is to slog through the implementation of an EDRMS system, or more appropriately to say, to try to implement one, or to develop an online descriptive tool, or to construct and apply appraisal and acquisition policies. It is hard work and it is essential work. It is the work of protecting archives is work that must continue and should be supported. But there is a quality I see in archivists that I think we need to address. It is a quality shared with most of humanity, one that people shed or should shed as we get older and wiser. My father, who was, for my sins, a psychiatrist, used to refer to this quality with the felicitous phrase, temporal chauvinism. My mother, who was a jazz singer, was more blunt. She just would say to me, listen, Missy, a lot of things happened before you were born. <laughs> temporal chauvinism is the belief that we, in our current generation, or our environment, or our profession, are the pinnacle, the last and the greatest, that our creations, inventions, and ideas are right and true and best, better than whatever came before. All generations in all societies suffer from this, I suspect, but it is a condition that is compounded by the self-importance that can come with becoming a specialist in any profession. We must resist the temptation to think that we, and we alone, as people, as archivists, or as today's archivists as opposed to yesterday's archivists, can by ourselves come up with the ultimate solution to the world's record-keeping problems. We may indeed have improved on the past, but someday someone else will improve on our work. A humbling fact that I delight in remembering every time one of my former students dances circles around me with ideas well beyond anything I ever dreamed of. More than many other professions, archivists are on the crest of a wave. And so above all, we must remember that we are not able to come up with definitive answers. 
As the world has been turned upside down by digital information technologies, those whose mission is to manage society's documentary evidence are surfing and occasionally floundering on this digital wave. We are no longer at the start, but we are far from the end. And so we must double down on our efforts to rise above our temporal chauvinism, to remember that anything we come up with today to solve records and archives problems is not going to be the last word. I remember when union lists and thematic guides were the ultimate solution to description. And more recently, when EDRMS systems were the ultimate solution to digital record keeping. And I laugh. Archivists must keep innovating absolutely. It's something we, and I mean you, do well, and something that should be encouraged. But archivists also need to be agile and flexible to realize that anything we come up with today will be superseded faster than you can say electronic document management system. <laughs> we can only do the best we can with what we have, and we cannot predict what the future will bring. What we can do, and what I think we don't do enough, is be more open about the fact that we are not in some mythical, magical, utopian archival universe where our solutions are the best and greatest and most sustainable. What we must do is admit openly and with humility that the world of archives and records is not magical, but messy. Very, very messy. We need the public to understand our predicament and to support us in our efforts to come up with approaches to records and archives care knowing that what we invent today may be obsolete tomorrow, but at least it's something where there was nothing before. So where do we need to focus our efforts to stay on top of that wave? Where do we need to forge links to improve on what we've done before or to build something new? The three areas that need our efforts are the three areas that had been at the heart of this conference, people, systems, and archives. Let me look at each of those in turn starting with archives, archives the stuff and archives the institution, to comment not on where we have been, but where we might go. As we all know, digital technologies have transformed physical documentary evidence into digital virtual records and data, shifting the emphasis away from physical institutions towards digital repositories and cloud computing. We know this and we are continuously looking for ways to respond. But it isn't just a one-time shift, analog to digital. It is a multi-layered, complex, continuous evolution. Paper to PDF, to MS Word, to database, to JPEG, to TIFF file, to ubiquitous big data. Perhaps the next will be virtual realities and Vulcan mind melts, who knows? What once was one simple document that fit into an acid-free file folder might now be a hybrid monster, a computer-generated, paper-supported creature composed of dozens of different and sometimes conflicting file types. Just when we figure out how to capture one technical element, PDFA versus PDF, for instance, someone changes the technology and away we go again. Sometimes there is no document at all anymore. Archivists have to rethink fundamentally our understanding of the nature of that evidence. This is the wave we surf, and we are struggling to stay upright. This is not just a change in digital technologies or the records they generate, but a change in the way in which societies communicate and document their communications. I am not sure that the custodial archival institution as we see it today will necessarily survive the change it certainly will not survive in its current form. Archival institutions acquire evidence. We are record keepers, memory keepers. But a record or a memory must exist before it can be captured, as we learned so tragically this morning in the discussion of the records of children in care. We have always necessarily worked with the past, and we have assumed that it is right and proper to wait for events to move from present to past, before we make final decisions about what we might or might not keep. Once that past is done, we bring those materials from the past into our custodial environment, and typically in Canada, at least, into an institution funded in full or in part by the public. I will not say that this custodial pro approach, or Canada's inclusive and all-encompassing total archives approach, are necessarily wrong. 
But I will say that Australia got ahead of that wave by coming up with the concept of series level control and the idea of a continuum. We North Americans are mired in custody and trapped by the phone, as are many archival institutions around the world. The fact is, we cannot wait 25 years to acquire digital records. There will be no le records left to acquire. But equally, we cannot acquire the millions of Instagram images or YouTube videos or Twitter messages whizzing around the globe every day. To create a more sustainable archival environment, we need to change the record keeping environment. We need to influence the technologies used not only to manage the records, but also used to create the records which takes us to the next link in our chain, which is systems. How do we create, adapt, and use the information and record-keeping systems at our disposal? And here I am speaking of technological systems, not social systems, though the latter are critically important, as I mention later. How do we make sure that all the effort we put into developing record-keeping tools like EDRMS is not lost when we are hit by the next technological wave? I believe that we are as a profession and a society, still at the stage of using technology to replicate old ways of working, rather than using technology to transform how we work. This is akin to thinking of a car as a horseless carriage, similar to a horse and buggy, rather than imagining a completely different way of transporting ourselves from point A to point B. Leonardo da Vinci conceived of a flying machine in 1485. Orville and Wilbur Wright took flight in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina in 1903. 418 years is a long time from conception to execution. We need to think like da Vinci and act like the Wright brothers, taking the chance and not being afraid to crash. When I first began to implement electronic record keeping systems with governments in Canada, I truly thought that commercial EDRMS systems were a game changer. Maybe they were. But it didn't take long for the EDRMS systems I encountered to become old and tired, and for me to become old and tired in the process. They were often unused by all but the records manager. While consultants like me were setting up layers and layers of folders for users and training them how to file their documents in centralized computers, those users were busy tagging their di digital records in SharePoint, conducting business through text messages and Twitter, and spending more time on their iPhones than their offices. Records professionals fell off that EDRMS wave, at least in Canada, by not staying nimble. We were doing what we thought was best, and I cannot fault us for that. But I submit that EDRMS systems are not transformative technologies. They are replicative technologies created to manage electronic records in a linear way similar to paper records management for many years. They return us to the age of central registries when what we need to do is imagine the power that computers might give us to create something new, an entirely different way of accessing and managing our information and evidence. Now many people in our profession are imagining a different future. And one of the ways we can forge links with systems it is to give these thinkers the space to be bold and innovative and daring. I am thinking of people like Peter Van Garderen, my friend and colleague in Canada, and the developer of the tools Access to Memory, or A2M, and Archivematica, who is now urging greater decentralization of archival management in an effort, as he and many others put it, to decolonize the archives. Like the developers of Ar Australia's Trove, a tool that does not just present descriptive information to users, but also allows users to create and share tags and virtual collection lists, building their own context for the content contained within the resource. People like Greg Rowland, whose thought-provoking and award-winning article on archival systems interoperability challenges the notion of what he calls fortress archives, arguing, as he put it, that monolithic archival control systems continue to position archives as jurisdictional resources that privilege a research-oriented audience. And like those researching new record-keeping opportunities, like the Record-Keeping Roundtable, who are actively looking at contemporary record-keeping issues, including, for instance, the place of technologies such as blockchain in records and archives management. These blue sky thinkers are going to lead records and archives management down exciting new paths, 
We need to give them the space and support they need to do this work. As David Fricker has suggested, the disruption brought by digital technologies opens the door for archival institutions and practitioners to reinvent processes and systems, not just to use tools to replicate old ways of working. We need to embrace and support this change in our institutions, our universities and educational environments, and in our professional associations and professional spaces. But as we imagine entirely new approaches to our age-old task, we must also remember that we are never going to create the best, last, only definitive, perfect resource. The idea that we will ever capture or control all the world's recorded information, or even that portion of the vast sum of information that we deem of enduring value, is frankly laughable. I think we take ourselves far too seriously when we even whisper these ideas. And when I say we, I do not mean just archivists. I mean society as a whole. Google's mission statement is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Please, spare me. <laughs> we need to remember, as Vern Harris said, that we are trying to capture a sliver of a sliver of a sliver. Knowing our limitations, coming from a place of humility, gives us the freedom to innovate because we then don't expect to get it right first time, every time. Today's best record keeping solution could be tomorrow's floppy disk drive. We need to be agile, flexible, bold, and daring, and yet still human, harnessing our temporal chauvinism in order to keep balancing on the surging wave. I can hear my mother's voice now saying, listen, Missy. <laughs> Being honest about our aspirations and our limitations is critical. And that understanding takes us to the third link we need to forge, the link with people. To me, this is the most important link, and it is the weakest in the chain. But before we can talk about people, we have to talk about money. Ever since I started in this profession, as an archival studies student at the University of British Columbia in 1982, I have listened to complaints about how we don't get enough recognition. We are underappreciated, ignored, neglected, poor us. Oliver is begging for gruel. Inevitably, the conversation is not really about we need more recognition. It is about we need more money. Give us more money and our jobs will be better. Give us more money and we will do well. So let me address the money question first, because we need to put that matter into perspective so we can address the people question. I know that the Australian archival community has been vocal in its opposition to threatened and actual budget cuts to archival services, including risks to the future of Trove. And I commend you for the public awareness campaigns you have conducted, including on Twitter, to raise awareness of the issue. I think Canadian archivists could learn from your example. As many of you may know, archival institutions and the archival community across Canada suffered from severe funding problems a few years ago. In 2012, the federal government eliminated our National Archival Development Program, which provided about $1.5 million a year to archival institutions across the country. The budget of Library and Archives Canada was also cut. Some improvements have come in the last couple of years. The 2015-16 budget for Library and Archives Canada, which is responsible for the archives of the federal government and for collecting and preserving archives of national significance across all of Canadian society, and which serves as our national library and deposit library, the budget for that institution is in the neighborhood of $90 million, a modest increase over past years. Beyond that, Library and Archives Canada now administers a new federal grant program to support archival institutions across the country, providing a total of $7.5 million in grant funds over five years, or $1.5 million a year, to nearly 1,000 eligible repositories. This all sounds fine until we hold the numbers up to the light. Last spring, Canada's new Liberal government, uh, mostly seen in the form of Justin Trudeau and his prolific selfies, <laughs> bless his heart, 
The government announced an increase in the budget for our Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, the national broadcaster. The government added $675 million to the existing budget. The goal was to modernize and revitalize the organization with a particular emphasis on managing digital technologies. I do not necessarily begrudge the CBC its budget, though many Canadians are expressing concern about the broadcaster's scope and mandate in a YouTube world. But if you ask me to compare a $675 million funding increase for our national broadcaster with a $90 million total budget to manage our federal government's documentary evidence and information resources, or $1.5 million a year to support some 1,000 archival institutions across Canada. And if you then ask me to declare that there is enough money for Canadian archives, I will say no. But even more troublesome to me is the fact that the work of archives and records management, particularly custodial archivals care, archival care is not considered mainstream enough to merit reasonable staff wages. So often deemed a cultural service, archival management, especially at the local level, is seen as something done by part-timers, volunteers, and students. Missionaries, not managers, as my friend and colleague, Canadian archivist Richard Volpe has said, and about, more about Richard later. I recently saw an advertisement for an archives technician at a municipal archives in one of Canada's provinces. The job involved digitizing historical photographs according to institutional standards, describing them according to rules for archival description, and uploading them into an archives database, as well as researching and implementing options for online photo sharing. The qualifications for this job were a degree Experience digitizing photographs, experiencing enter data, entering data into complex databases, knowledge of care of handling of photographs, attention to detail, excellent written communication skills, knowledge of copyright protection, and desirable were familiarity with descriptive standards, experience with online photo sharing platforms, and familiarity with archival databases. It's a cool job. I'm not qualified to do that job. I wouldn't even dream of applying. It is a temporary, full-time position for 30 weeks. It would pay $17 an hour, plus 4% vacation pay. That is $6 more an hour than the minimum wage in the province in question. And Canada, each province sets its own minimum wage. The total income for this temporary position would be less than $21,000 for six months, plus $800 or so in vacation pay. The cost of a rental apartment in the city in question ranges from $800 to $2,000 a month. So $6,000 is going to go from your pay packet before you've even factored in food, transportation, or taxes. There is something seriously wrong with this picture. We need to change the culture around the work of archives and archivists. Yes, more money and the recognition of the value of this work and the skills involved would be great. But here is radical me. I do not believe the problem is really a lack of money in this case. More worrisome to me than the pitiful dollar figures made available in funding programs and in jobs like this is the fact that this funding is premised on an assumption that existing custodial archival institutions will just keep ticking along managing old stuff, and that they will use this new money to help them keep more old stuff. Dusty dead kittens comes to mind. Providing more money for custodial archival operations, more grant programs, higher salaries, and so on, may help us deal with our legacy records, but it will not help us stay on or get ahead of the wave of digital information technologies. What we need to do in order to change the financial picture is change the culture. We need to get people to understand that they hold in their hands, on their cell phones, their tablets, and in their cloud-based social media platforms, not only their current digital memory, but also their future documentary legacy. We cannot take custody of that evidence, not now, not tomorrow, or 10 years from now, if people do not understand and appreciate how to manage those records now. We need to forge links with the public, with users, and with society as a whole. We need to change the conversation. 
Thus, to me, the most important action need, archivists need to take now is not curatorial, it's cultural. We need to work urgently and vigorously at raising public awareness of the value of documentary evidence. Records creators, records users, and society at large, from corporate bosses to school children, need to understand the value of records and archives and learn how to protect their own archives for accountability, identity, and memory. We talk a lot about public engagement, but I suggest with respect that we are too often talking to ourselves. We need to start talking more to the world. We need to look beyond the boundaries of our institutions and the limitations of our systems. As John Hawking, the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations, advised us in a powerful keynote speech to the International Congress on Archives this past September, we need to get out of the box and into the world. As many will know from my writings and presentations, I have suggested that we can learn a great deal from the vision and model used to change society's understanding of waste, recycling, and environmental management. Just as the public, for the most part, understands that our global environment is at risk and that we must and can take steps to protect our precious natural resources, we archivists need to get the public to understand that society's documentary, documentary memory is at risk and that urgent and sustained action is needed to achieve real change in how evidence is created, managed, used, and preserved. Today in Canada and in Australia and many other parts of the world, I believe recycling is more or less a given. Blue bins in Canada, compost buckets are universal, we teach our children the phrase, reduce, reuse, recycle. When we see a little triangle on the bottom of our plastic water bottle, we think, recycle. A few decades ago, we would think nothing of tossing scrap paper in the garbage. Now we look for a recycling bin every time we want to dispose of something. When I was a kid, recycling was as foreign a concept to me as the idea that one day I would carry my telephone around in my pocket. This change in our understanding of garbage happened because the visionaries of the recycling movement did four things. First, they redefined garbage, creating the concept of recyclables and thereby changing how society thinks about its waste. Second, they created mechanisms for making recycling easier, developing technologies and systems from recycling boxes to compost buckets. Third, they did not wait for people to come to them and ask how to recycle. They went out to the public and taught them how, when, and why to manage their garbage differently. And fourth, they raised awareness of the importance of recycling, convincing people that it's good to recycle, and making people feel they were part of a larger global movement for social and environmental change. Now, we wouldn't dream of tossing our Starbucks paper coffee cup on the ground instead of putting it in a recycling bin. Of course, we haven't got used to the idea of not using that paper cup in the first place. The reduced part of recycling is, to me, the next great challenge we have to face there. But today, when we see that little plastic triangle, it speaks volumes to us, as the, does the deposit on our drink containers and the line so common at the bottom of the email my telephone company sends me, which says, before printing, think of the environment. I want to pursue the same strategy for the protection of records and archives. I want to create a culture where people understand implicitly the importance of the record-keeping equivalent of reduce, reuse, recycle. And the phrase I suggest is remember, respect, record. What if when you received an email from your telephone company, at the bottom of the message was a line of text? What if, instead of saying, before printing, think of the environment, it said, before deleting, think of the future? How marvelous would that be? It is this fundamental cultural change that I believe will help support all the other changes we need to make. The move to an effective, decentralized, post-custodial environment, the support for the development of innovative and sustainable record-keeping systems, the provision of better and more reliable funding for records and archives preservation, and the recognition of the expertise that records professionals bring to managing society's documentary evidence. But it is a change that we cannot make by ourselves. We need to work with records creators and records users. 
we need to get our message out to the public at large, not just to a small constituency of researchers or lawyers or genealogists. We need to reach out to the public. But in order to do that, we need to reposition ourselves, adopt a strategic path, and align ourselves on that wave so we can keep moving forward, knowing that anything we develop today will need to be reconsidered over and over again as time goes by. I mentioned my friend and colleague Richard Valpe, who's now retired as head of the Archives of the Northwest Territories in Canada. Richard is arguing in a forthcoming article in Archivaria that archivists have not yet demonstrated the relationship between the existence of archival materials and the efforts needed to ensure that those materials are safe, secure, and readily available. As Richard writes, archivists have to do more than just try to convince people that we are useful. We have to become useful with the real problems of records and information management in the 21st century. To do this, we need to reach beyond our professional and institutional boundaries and work directly with the public whose interests we serve. We need to forge links with people. To do that, we need to make changes in archives and in systems. I believe, like the recycling movement, we need to take four distinct and similar actions. First, we need to redefine archives so that records created today are managed effectively from the start, not after the fact. Then, whether those materials come into the physical custody of an archival institution or are captured in a digital storage environment, they would be preserved with their evidential value intact. Archives are not old. Archives are not linear. They are not traditional. We need to imagine a very different concept of archives, as Mike Jones was saying today. As part of this redefinition, archivists must become much more proficient in the use of digital record-keeping technologies. And we need to convince record creators of the importance of establishing quality records care from the beginning, of making good records, not just keeping what somebody else has made by happenstance. Records and archives education needs to be transformed, not just adapted. We need to forge links with computer science programs to make space for innovative research on digital data management, encourage interdisciplinary studies in how to manage society's documentary evidence. As a former student and colleague of mine, Anthea Sellis says, and she is now head of digital transformation at the National Archives in the UK, we need to look at ourselves less as record keepers and more as data sciences whose focus is on respecting evidence. The second action, then, we need to work more closely with the developers of digital technologies to help build tools that ensure that records are authentic and reliable from the start. This means embedding ourselves in technology companies like Microsoft or IBM or Apple so that software solutions are built with record keeping, privacy, access, and archiving by design, not as an afterthought. We need to make good records, not just find better ways to keep what is made. We also need to reduce the volume of records made, just as Starbucks needs to reduce the number of paper cups used, so that the records that are created are the best evidence we can have. As part of this technical role, we need to accept that success in digital records management will come from teamwork, not from working in isolation. We need to bring our expertise to those teams and insert ourselves in places we never considered part of our world even a decade ago. Information security management, compliance, governance, risk management, business process management. I have been amazed and awed by the conversations here about Australian innovations and collaborations, particularly in the area of technology. And again, I think Canadians have a lot to learn from you. As long as we remember we can't know or do it all, if we are humble and open and ready for change, then we can move forward on the wave. Third. Archivists need to expand our services as facilitators, guides, and advisors. 
We need more and more archival consultants, similar to lawyers and accountants, people who work directly with records creators to support quality records creation and management, waiting to pe help people with their archives later, but not helping them with, with their records now, is like suggesting that doctors wait for patients to develop full-blown diabetes before putting them on a low-carb diet, rather than educating the healthy person about the risks of diabetes so they don't develop the condition in the future. But to create the environment where we can undertake these first three actions, redefine archives, create better tools, and support accountable records care from the start, we have to change public perceptions about archives. So the fourth step is to engage with the public actively, vigorously, and persuasively, raising awareness about the value of documentary evidence and the role of archives in society, and the danger of assuming that computers will solve all our information problems. If the public does not appreciate what we are trying to achieve on their behalf, they will not give us the time or space or resources to play our part. As another Canadian friend, Tom Nesmith, has argued in his award-winning Archivaria article last year, we are in an archival stage in the history of knowledge. As he argues, the public does value archives, and they use archives actively. We see this in the innumerable genealogy TV shows, the rise of sources like Ancestry, the intense interest in the records of the past for data, DNA studies, genetic studies, analyzing trends in climate change. The users of archival materials today include not just traditional historical researchers or genealogists, but representatives of many other sectors of society, from educators, lawyers, social and physical scientists to economists, geographers, and political activists. We need to forge links with all those people who value and use archives. We need them to see the machinery behind the magic. The world needs to understand that, that archives do not digitize themselves, that records are not born, arranged, and described and in good order, and that documents cannot be preserved pos for posterity if we do not change the way we manage them from the point of creation. As Richard Volpe suggests, we need to demonstrate that there is a direct relationship between the existence of quality archives and the work involved in guaranteeing that existence. As we forge these links with the public, we will start to change the culture, and we can then start to create a more sustainable future for the archival endeavor. More support, better tools, improved systems. As Richard argues, and I agree, the missing link in our archival efforts is the voice of the public, the people outside the archival community, people who have a stake in accountability, transparency, and the documentary heritage of our society but who are not directly involved in the day-to-day -day management of archival materials. We need to bring those people into the conversation and give them a much, much stronger voice in order to change the culture around records and archives care. There is no one way to achieve this goal. We can encourage the creation of stakeholder-driven organizations, which is what Richard is encouraging us to do. He's calling for the establishment of what he calls a Canadian Documentary Heritage Commission, a public-facing advocacy group led not by archivists, but by members of the public. We can also meet less often with each other and more often with colleagues and partners, from historians to genealogists, lawyers to scientists to share our different understandings of records and archives. I understand next year's ACA is being planned in conjunction with the Information Technology Indigenous Communities Group, and I applaud you for the innovation of that act. I encourage more of that kind of collaborative work. We can seek the support of records champions, people like Justice Cote, as well as academics, politicians, celebrities, or sports figures. And we can communicate more directly with the public in popular magazines, fiction and nonfiction books, television and radio programs. You give an award for writing for the public, and congratulations, Mike, for receiving it. We need more of those awards. We need more of that writing. Where are the short stories, the novels, the films with archivists, archives and archivists as a thread? Where, I ask you, is our Indiana Jones? 
We need to find new and creative ways to get our message out, to demonstrate to the public that there is a record-keeping reality behind WikiLeaks and the Panama Papers and Hillary Clinton's emails and whatever Donald Trump said lately. <laughs> we would not know about these record-keeping crises if someone hadn't kept a record in the first place or at least raised the alarm about the destruction or mismanagement of that record. We want and need to foster an environment in which the relationship between the creation of records and the safe care of records is understood and valued, an environment in which facts are respected, events are remembered, and evidence is recorded. At a more practical level, we can develop such tools as speakers bureaus, lists of experts who can go to conferences and offer input on archives. We can develop prepared speeches, good and exciting speeches, not boring talks, about the value of records and archives to society. We can prepare elevator speeches. We need to ditch the cardigans. <laughs> Our professional associations have a key role to play here. Sorry. Our professional associations have a key role to play here, and I will say that I hope, expect, and urge my Canadian association to transform itself mightily to face this new world, embracing a public voice in promoting care for archives and records. The Association of Canadian Archivists may have great baseball games, even though we've had to impose the John Roberts rule. <laughs> but we are not good at outreach and public relations. We need to do whatever we can in Canada, Australia, and elsewhere to get the public on board and to let them run with the idea that archives are an essential part of a civilized society. I heard someone say something today that resonated deeply with me, but at the same time troubled me greatly. This person said we have to show users that it's not just an archive. And I ask, why would we use the word just an archive? What if we lived in a world where we could say, it's an archive, and people would say, yes, I get it, I understand, and I care. Riding the wave, being honest, innovative, and open will help us move in that direction. So to conclude, the theme of this conference is forging links. And it's given us an excellent platform on which to enjoy thoughtful, stimulating, and engaging presentations to share ideas and aspirations about the archival mission, and to build, foster, and strengthen the bonds that bring archivists together. The best way to, to achieve success, I submit, is going to be by forging links with the public, by being honest and open about our limitations, recognizing that we are riding a wave of change. Archivists need to remain agile and nimble and sharp so that we can do our part to play, do our part to help our communities in Canada, Australia, and around the world, document their actions, transactions, communications, and decisions in order to support accountability, identity, and memory. Let us not just forge links, but build bridges. And let us not just ride the wave, but make some waves of our own. Thank you.